Yep. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to uh, let it go for a couple minutes and uh, let everybody uh, come in. And when the rate of attendees starts to level out, then we'll start. I hope everybody's having a good day. It's looking, uh, it was sunny out before, now it's really gray. Yeah, it is. Well, yeah, but well, that's, that's tis the season of grayness and things like that, so. Um, oh my God. I'm looking at my Christmas cards. One of them was very cute. <laughs> oh, cool. Oh, 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 you just got them from the mail. Very cute. It was very cute. Nice. Well, the the three-year-old looks about as big as her brother who's six. I don't know. What oh, wow. Is, yeah. Maybe a basketball scholarship. We can only hope. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, one of uh, one of Lily's friends is, um, I mean, Lily's very short for her age, and she's the youngest kid in her entire grade. So one of her friends is one of the oldest and one of the tallest. And I have a picture of them with the, the tall, with her friend resting her arm on Lily's head, just totally nonchalantly. And they're the same age. So, That's so that is so cute. They'll be yep. good. They'll be good yep. friends. That's yeah. Good. They, they, they just had a, um, so like Lily and six of her friends had a, a holiday party that the girls um, arranged all themselves. They arranged a potluck where everybody made food and brought food like the kids did this to, to one of the kids' houses. Um, Lily made punch because nobody was going to bring a drink. And um, and they had like games and all this other kind of stuff. It was like, you know, a real holiday party, but the kids did it all themselves. So. Well, I hope they remember that. I'm, I'm going to a Christmas party next week with seven friends that I went to school with in kindergarten. Wow. Kindergarten. Wow. <laughs> and we get together now and it's wonderful. So hope those girls have the same memories. It's a wonderful yeah. it's a wonderful well, now it's all like documented, right? There's tons of pictures and videos and everything like yeah, that. No, have all that. <laughs> so uh that kind of stuff will last forever. Um all right, so uh it looks like the rate of um attendees entering has leveled out. So uh why don't we go ahead and start? Welcome, welcome. Um, as you know, I am Bob Keith, joined by my colleague and um, uh, uh, what is your title at NJLTA again? I, I, I think I'm the office manager or something. I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> of the New Jersey Library Trustee Association. Yep. Yes. Yes. And um, uh, Michelle Stricker sends her regrets. She is on vacation um, and uh, um, Pat Pavlak also sends her regrets um, at being unable to be here as well. Uh, so today's uh, subject is per capita state aid and the annual survey and all the things that kind of go, um, go with that and go around that. Uh, there's going to be a lot to get through. So if you have any questions, as we always say, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type your question in. Oh, Pat disappeared. Um, I'm here. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to type in a question. If you have something else to say, like to chat amongst your fellow attendees or just chat with us, use the chat button for that. Uh, we try to keep them separate so that they're um, easy to um, differentiate what needs to be responded to and what is just, you know, most of the time idle conversation. And uh, um, again, this will, as we always do, this is being recorded. We will upload it to YouTube and send the um, link out on NJ Pub Libs and, and the NJ LTA listserv uh, sometime tomorrow. And you can watch that. And remember that this is, uh, this qualifies and the video, watching the video qualifies as your uh, trustee training requirement for state aid. So, with that, let me, actually, let me take a drink, first of all. And let me launch the slideshow. And, oops. And then 
Let me share my screen. Oops. And let's see, hopefully this works. Okay. Does everyone see, everyone should see per capita state aid and statistics. Um, if you don't, raise your hand. Um, but I'm pretty sure everybody's going to see that. Uh, let me just move some windows around here so that I can see the things that I need to see. All right. So um, I was looking at the, um, the list of attendees, the list of people that signed up for this uh, before we started. And it looks like there's definitely a good amount of trustees in this. These, um, these sorts of things usually are geared towards library directors because the library directors are the, the people that are putting together the application for state aid, filling out the annual survey, doing all that kind of paperwork. And the directors, I mean, the, the, the trustees really don't have that much to do with it. Uh, you'll see the, one of the, the board, of, board president will sign the accuracy certification. But beyond that, there's not that much that they have um, uh, involvement with. But it's good that you all are here so that you can know what your director is doing, um, especially in January and into March when they're running around frantic trying to get all this data to fill out for, uh, for the survey. So with that, um, briefly, the per capita state aid program is, is not a grant, it's, a, it's basically a reward to municipalities and counties for providing good library service. So if a municipality or county funds their library at the correct level, that they are able to provide the minimum um, required services that are in the regulations to qualify for state aid, then that municipality or county is rewarded with state aid money. And currently the fund, the total fund for state aid is a little over $4.6 million. And uh, that has gone up by about a million dollars um, or so um, in the last couple of years. And, but it's still not fully funded by the legislature. It's still only about 40% of what it should be uh, of, of, of full funding. So uh, I know NJLA is, and, and, and even the state library puts in budget requests for state aid to be fully funded. Um, NJLA talks to legislators to uh, get state aid fully funded. And um, so far they've done a little bit. It went up, like I said, about a million dollars, but it's, you know, we still have a ways to go. Um, so there's two main pieces of legislation or laws or regulations that govern the state aid program. Uh, the first is uh, Title 18A, 74-1 of the New Jersey statutes. Uh, that is, the section of laws that govern the structure of the program and how funds are to be dispersed, the manner that they're dispersed, when they're dispersed, things like that. The um, New Jersey Administrative Code, 15-21-1, um, lays out the minimum standards to qualify for state aid. So we'll go into what those regulations look like and um, what they're based on and, and things like that and you know, show you how you could go in and see what your own minimum standards are. But those are the things that if you, um, if you don't meet those minimum standards, they carry a certain percentage reduction for state aid for a library that can go up to 100%. That can go up to all of your state aid being, being withheld if your library does not meet a certain number of minimum standards. Uh, there is three steps to apply for state aid uh, in, in no particular order. They are the application for state aid, and we'll go, we'll go over these um, in more detail um, in a little bit. But the application for state aid is a form that the municipal or county CFO fills out. The accuracy certification is another form that the library fills out. And the annual survey is a, well, it's just what it says, it's a, it's a survey collecting all the data from, from the library from the previous year. Uh, and that is done on an online survey instrument that we'll look at later. And the director or someone that the director delegates to is usually the person that uh, fills all that information out, collects all the information from various people in the library, fills out the survey, 
and submits it to the state library. Um, we have this link here for the per capita state aid uh, webpage on our website. And I'm just gonna click it and hopefully it will open up in the right window. Uh, let's see, is it open up? Yeah, okay. So this is the main per capita state aid webpage. Um, and, and, and yes, I see the question that, uh, that we can provide the, a link to the slides. I'll upload those to our, um, probably upload them right here to the per capita state aid webpage. And, um, and I'll include that in the, uh, the message that I send out with the reporting. So per capita state aid webpage has um, a little bit of preamble information <clears throat> and some links, gives you the 2020 census, the populations for that we work off of for per capita state aid and the survey work off of the decennial census from the federal government. So um, that information is there. And then you'll see these um, kind of accordion sections here that have various data. And so uh, the most recent round of state aid that we processed this year was working off of data from 2022. And this is what you would see at the end of the state aid season. You would say you'd see an Excel spreadsheet, the final check amount. You would see a, a, a PDF with the award letters that we send out. Some auditors require award letters as proof that the library actually got their state aid. And then you'll see this link, which is also up here and also up here. And that is your spreadsheet to uh, determine or, or that shows you what, if you're a municipal library at least, what your third of the mill would be based off of the equalized valuation for the, um, uh, uh, that, that we get from the division of taxation. And that determines what the minimum amount that your library is to be funded in the next year. So um, we're looking at, we just got the information this year, 2023, for next year. And that was published out on uh, uh, NG Pub Libs back in, uh, back in October. Uh, so it comes out around the 1st of October every year. And we publish that. And so libraries know what they have to spend the next year for their budgets. And it kind of goes down here. And that's pretty much it. During the state aid season, which is starts in the middle of January, and the survey uh, deadline is March 15th. The year that we're working off of will be automatically opened when you come to this web page, and there will be a lot more information here. There will be a link to the application for state aid, a link to the accuracy certification, a link to the survey itself, and several other documents that a library might need or would definitely need to apply for state aid to send us that, that stuff. Um, but right now it's not there because we're kind of in between uh, in between state aid seasons. So uh, that's not there. So let's go back to the survey, uh, not to the survey, the presentation, and talk about the uh, state library aid law. What does it do? It's not a big section of laws, but um, it does uh, give the, the building blocks, the, the foundation for the state aid program. So the state aid library aid law talks about how state aid is actually calculated for the different types of libraries throughout the state, how eligibility for state aid is determined, how and when state aid is distributed and for what state aid may be used. And I get that question a lot. Um, you know, they, so a director might call and say, we just, we got our state aid payment. Can we use it to buy books? Can we use it to pay for utilities? Can we use it to pay for salaries, et cetera, et cetera? And the answer is to all of those, yes. You can use it for, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, any library purpose. So you couldn't use it to, uh, you know, throw a party for a retiree or something like that. But same, it, it can be used basically the same way as your uh, municipal or county allocation is used. So. How state aid is calculated. This is going to be um, some, some kind of pseudo math. I used to have a, do a presentation with this with a lot of numbers and a lot of calculations, and it kind of um, made people's eyes cross. So I'm just going to kind of talk through it and uh, hope that everybody can understand it. And if you can't understand it, uh, pop a question in the Q&A. And, um, and I'll try to answer it. So. For municipal and association libraries, you can see there's a star there, it means for association libraries that are not in counties with county libraries, the calculation is this. The per capita rate 
times the population of the town times the proration factor. So what does all that mean? The per capita rate is derived from the, uh, the statute, 18A 74-3. And um, let me just go right ahead real quick. Um, don't have the actual laws in here, but we can go to the law if you want. But it basically, in the law, it, it gives like a sort of a table and says, if you're funded at a third of the mill, you get a dollar twenty-five per capita for state aid. If you're funded at, um, you know, half a mill, you get a dollar fifty. If you're funded at lower than a third of the mill, it could go down all the way to fifty cents per capita, depending upon how um, the the funding level of the library. So that's derived from that, and it's based on the funding the library receives. Like I said, the one third of the mill equals a dollar twenty-five per capita. The population, as we talked about before on the, on the website, is the decennial census population of the town or towns, in case you're, you're a county or joint library. And the proration factor is a percent that we add into the formula because state aid is not fully funded. So remember at the um, beginning, I said that state aid is about 40% fully funded. So we add in a proration factor that varies from year to year because of fluctuations in what libraries libraries that receive state aid, libraries that don't receive state aid if they make their minimum standards or don't make their minimum standards. And, but it's generally right now around 40 to 41%. And we add that so that it lowers everyone's state aid by an equal percentage so that we don't overspend the money in the fund. We don't also don't underspend the money in the fund, which is um, not as bad, but still a problem. Um, again, if you have any questions, put them in the Q&A and I will uh, talk about them uh, either at the end or when I need a break from talking. Uh, so for county libraries, um, county libraries is a similar type of thing, but it's per capita rate times the population as a proration factor, but it's not for the county library itself. It's for all the towns in the county supporting the county library. That the, our state aid system does that calculation for all of those towns based on how much money they paid into the county library. And that determines their per capita rate. And then we add up all of those amounts of what each town would have received in state aid. And then that's what the county gets. Now, in some counties, there are, count, there are um, municipal libraries that don't support, don't pay money to support the county library those towns are not part of that calculation. Likewise, in um, counties that have um, association libraries in them, uh, that are often member libraries, um, it's the per capita rate times the population times the proration factor. You add together the amount the municipality pays for the county library and for the association library. So in many cases, in these association libraries, the town, is paying an amount directly to the county to support the county library, but they're also paying a small amount to the association library to support their operations in their town. And what our state aid system does is it takes those two numbers and figures out what the percentage each is of what the total would be of those two numbers, and then calculates the state aid and apportions the state aid payment based on that percentage calculated. So most, in, in, in most cases, a large portion of the state aid payment will go to the county, but a small portion of that will actually go directly to the association library in that county. Um, and you would be very surprised at how uh, long it took to figure that out, looking at the law and looking at the code of our uh, state aid system. Uh, it, it was um, embarrassingly long. But um, we have a couple of questions. I'm just going to take a break real quick from doing this. So does per capita specifically mean the population of the municipality regardless of age? What if the population has significantly changed since the last census? Um, so it does. it is regardless of age. It's whatever the census counts as human beings living in that, in that town based off of whatever criteria the census uses that they publish on their website um, as the official census, the official decennial census number. If the population changes significantly between one decennial census and, the, and, and another, well then 
it, we we don't report we don't use that change. We only use the federal decennial census. So in our case now, we would have to wait until 2030 for the next population figures to come out. Pat has a question. Uh, Bob, did you um, uh, use the 2020 census last year as the population figure, or will this be the first year that you're using the 2020 census? No, I used the 2020, 2020 census last year. Okay. We could have used it even the year before, but if you remember, there were some, um, uh, let's be kind and call them issues uh, at census in delays and ways people were counted and things like that, that, um, that really delayed the release of the census figures. And it basically made it so we couldn't use it um, for 2020 data, the, you know, for the state aid that was paid out in 2021. We had to use it for the next year, but it was, it, we, we just didn't have the figures. We didn't have the, the, the official figures. And we always, always have to wait for those official figures from the federal government. So the, the checks that you sent out in October of 2023 were based on the 2020 census for the first time? Yes. Well, for the, yeah, 20, well, 2023 is th this year. So actually the checks we sent out last year were based on um, the, the 2020 census. Okay. Because I, again, I think it's it's very helpful that a lot of trustees are on this webinar because um, directors, because of the change in populations, have have often said to them, "We need to say increase staff members because mm -hmm. of going up in census. We need to increase the number of books or whatever we do." So it's really very important that they understand that because their directors, for the first time in ten years or so, are coming back and saying like our numbers are changing in terms yes. of our minimum requirements based on the new census data. So I think that's important. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, there, there's, that's not to say that they can't use at a local level, the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the census estimates that come out, I believe from the state, I don't know what um, department in the state puts out those estimates, but, um, but I often see them online and things like that. And I think um, the people here are referring to that, that um, there are census estimates, yearly census estimates, but they are not official. We can't use them to pay out state aid. We can't use them for, for other, other things, especially even dealing with the federal government, but you can use it locally to plan for things and, and see demographic changes um, on a shorter time scale. Right, so, but you wouldn't, okay. for example, add a new staff member for state aid purposes only based on the decennial census. Exactly, yeah. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Okay. And the second question here, uh, please clarify the county issue. Do county libraries receive or does the payment go to the county? So um, that is an interesting question. And I am going to open up. Uh, let's see, can you guys see that? Let's go to the library law section. It's a good time to go there. Scroll down to part four, the state library aid law. I may have a slide about this, but we're here already, so let's just talk about it now. Um, county counties with libraries, a uh, portion of state aid. This county is established county pursuant to the da -da -da. portion of state aid as follows: each municipality that provides tax support, the local library will qualify for capital state aid in a formula based and subject to the state shall be paid to the government body of the municipality. So that's if there is a municipal library in the county um, or an association library um, that uh, goes to the county. You, you know, that's that that's where 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 that is. Each county shall qualify for capital state aid based on tax support provided by each municipality. This is what I was talking about before about municipalities that give support the state aid is calculated for them and added to the total for the county. Um, distribution of state aid to any county or municipality which supports in whole or in part library services from county or municipal tax revenues. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, sorry, let me um, read this and make sure I get it right. Tribute funds pursuant to the rules and regulations according to the funds allocated pursuant to the section shall be distributed as grants to qualified applicants based on competitive criteria and selection of state library. Uh, da, da, da. I believe there was something that said, and Pat, you know this too, 
So you can jump in if I'm uh, not seeing it. Um, payment of state aid method. Payments will be made to the governing body of each municipality qualifying for aid under this chapter or to the treasurer, this is what I was looking for, or to the treasurer of each county which supports a regional or county library system. So this is definitely a slide that I have later on, but we can just skip it later on and I'll and talk about it now. The point is, Bob, that it has to be used for library purposes. So even if it goes, True. If it goes to the county, it can only be used for library purposes. So they turn True. it to their county library. But but we we just had we just did a project at the state library that was looking at the addresses that um, Treasury had for the um, uh, for all the libraries that we pay state aid to and making sure the addresses were correct. And there were a lot of you know places that uh, the the state aid payment goes directly to the municipality or to the county offices, and then they either just turn the check over or they deposit it and cut a new check or some, something like that. But this, but there are also a large number of municipals, municipalities and county libraries that uh, get the check directly to them. And that's based off of an agreement that the library or um, that the library has made with the town or county way back in the midst of time and allows the check to just go there because it's going to go there eventually anyway, so why not just cut out the middleman? Uh, but the statute says that the payment should be made to the, to the municipality or the county directly. So um, that's just to answer the question the person asked here, the anonymous attendee. Um, so, uh, so basically, to answer the question, uh, do county libraries receive or does the payment go to the county? Uh, the answer is yes and yes. Uh, you could it could go either way, depending upon the agreement that you work out with your county government. Uh, and like I said, it's often more efficient to just have it go directly to the library. But if their accounting system and, and auditing um, uh, and their auditor advises that it should go to the county, then that's what you have to do. So uh, let's go back to the presentation. Um, OK. So we did this. This is a this is this is a, a, a weird one. I want everybody to take a look at this closely. Um, towns that don't have libraries but contract with other libraries for library service. So what does that mean? There are um, there are a number of libraries in the state, not many, very, very few actually, that do that do not exist in counties with county systems. Um, and also um, do not have their own library. So their residents are kind of out of luck for library service, unless the town contracts with a neighboring town with like some sort of shared services agreement or something like that, where the town without the library will either pay a, pay an, a fee to the town with the library so that the town without the library's residents can go to that other library and get library services, or they will reimburse residents in their town for out of, um, out of town cards for non-resident cards at another town's library. Uh, there's a number of different ways they can do it, but this is so that those towns that are paying for that can ap apply for state aid based on the money that they paid either to that library or in reimbursing cards and get state aid based off of that. Now, um, as you can probably um, surmise, this is a teensy tiny amount. Um, I, I was looking at an example when I was making this, um, the town of Alpine in Bergen County pays or paid last year at least $600 for library services. I don't have the um, library that they contract with um, in front of me. Um, if somebody knows it, they can put it in the chat. But they um, they paid this money, and um, and then they apply for state aid. They send in the application for state aid. They don't have a library, so there's no survey to fill out or accuracy certification to fill out. They just send in the application, and then we put it in our system. And based off of the equalized valuation of the property in the town and things like that, it determined that the per capita rate for that six hundred dollars is fifty cents per capita. And I think the um, the uh, population was about 
twelve hundred or something like that, and the with the proration factor it ended up being about three hundred dollars that they got back. So that money has to be used, as we'll see later, for library services. So they can basically use that money to offset any money that they were going to pay out of their general fund for this contracted library service um, with another town. And um, this is just a, a weird little provision of the state aid uh, law that allows those towns to be rewarded for providing some sort of library service for the people in their town. Okay. Um, eligibility for state aid. So all public libraries that, um, that are recognized as public libraries in the state um, uh, are, are eligible for state aid, but there are some caveats to that. So just read through the statute real quick. In order to participate in any apportionment made according to the provisions of, uh, provisions of this chapter, municipalities and counties shall comply with the regulations and standards which have been or which may be prescribed by law or recommended by the state librarian. And so that basically means that as long as you as a library follow all the statutes that govern your type of library and adhere to the minimum standards for your, the population, basically most of the minimum standards we'll see are based on population. As long as you adhere to all those minimum standards, you should receive state aid. You will, you will receive state aid. Um, so let's see if we can, if this will open up correctly. Do, 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 do. Okay, so this is um, the state aid regulations. Um, and you can see it's on our library law page. It's gonna be in part four of the library law page. We'll go to another tab here and uh, go down here. It is part four under per capita state aid regulations right here, or bullet down. And so I'm not gonna read all this. It's a pretty long page. You can read it at your leisure. Um, but uh, it basically lays out all of the minimum standards that libraries are held to in order to receive state aid. So um, there are um, uh, these the governance questions. Um, you know, if they're receiving tax support in a certain way or something like that. There is certification. Um, each municipality or county. Um, uh, da, 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 shall be exempt from meeting with the remote requirement for the state as much as time as the current debt is required. That's from that's an old thing and um, should probably be removed. Um, this is a big one that we always kind of sound like a broken record about the seven total hours of library board training for the year. Um, that carries a 100% reduction in state aid, as we'll see when we scroll down. And libraries serving over 7,500 population or above must employ in all professional librarian positions, someone with a New Jersey State Professional Librarian Certificate. Um, and that includes the director. So especially for, um, for that, because you have that uh, one full-time person as director. Uh, employees, there's a big table, as you can see, it breaks it down by category, by um, population category. And it tells you how many of each type of employee, whether that's they call, I, I know it, it's not, um, not the best nomenclature to say nowadays, but they call professionals, they mean librarians, people with that New Jersey professional librarian certificate and all other staff are other people that work at the library that don't have that. So um, they, you can work out based on your population, how many of each type of employee you need to have. And if you note, the professional librarians are based on a 35 hour work week and the, all their staff are based on a 30 hour work week. Don't ask me why, but that's, that's the way it is. Um, this is the way it's been since uh, for a very long time. There are some footnotes here to read through. They're very important. Um, I won't read through them right now, but um, it's, you know, uh, it's important to know these little uh, edge cases and things like that. Um, the professional staff section talks about Basically, um, if you have a, a, you know, your director must have a New Jersey professional librarian certificate. Um, and then this clause in here is when this uh, regulation was put in, these people within between this population were grandfathered in to um, 
you know, so they they were people, there were people that serving as director did not have a New Jersey professional librarian certificate, but they were within this thing. So they were um, exempt from that requirement as long as that person stayed director at that library. As soon as they left, the next person was not, could, could not be, uh, could not use that clause. And they had to just be, if they were over 7,500 population, they had to have the certificate. Uh, Again, I'm just going to go quickly through here. You can read this um, at your leisure. It's, it is it is kind of interesting. Uh, the section on library materials, it determines, it says you need to have a certain size of collection for your population. Um, there's a section here for periodical holdings, which we no longer enforce because all libraries have access to Jersey Clicks and the uh, periodical databases contained therein. And so they automatically qualify for that, uh, that requirement. And so we just stopped, uh, stopped checking for it uh, just to save us some time. Um, the service section uh, talks about um, hours per week, minimum hours open per year, uh, number of um, days open per week, five days open per week, three evening um, evenings. Evenings are defined um, this in, in um, there's one section actually before the this section because of the way our web page was created um, that defines evenings as any two hours after six p.m. So you would have to have um, your library open three evenings um, and unless they are um, under seventy five hundred population, in which case thirty hours would be scheduled and only two instead of three evenings. Um, note here that variations are permitted as long as the minimum hours open per year standard is met or is authorized by the state librarian. So there have been at least two libraries in the last couple of years that have um, asked about this, asked to um, you know have this variation put into effect so that they weren't held to the evening standard in particular. And we required that they do a um, community survey with focus groups and things like that to determine if the um, if the residents in their town really were okay with the library not being open um, the required number of evenings. And in those cases, it came out that they were okay with that. And so the state librarian granted um, a wait a three year waiver for those libraries. At the end of that three years, they would have to do that evaluation process over again if they still want to be held to that um, to not be held to that. Um, the standard published here. Um, the, there's a training requirements for, again, professionals and all other staff. And um, there is some other little things like um, all public libraries should be members of the library cooperative, Library Link and J in this case. Um, there is some other things. Um, libraries should offer a minimum level of service. They shall offer interlibrary loan through current technology, which is Jersey Cat. Basically, if you're if you're part of Jersey Cat, you qualify for that. They must provide some children's programming, and they must provide a library web page with links to databases, um, and they must provide knowledgeable service. There's also a clause in here. Uh, each library shall provide free access to the internet all the hours the library is open. So um, I'm not an attorney. Defining the word free can be a little fraught because there are some, some libraries that would like to charge money for guest passes. Uh, we have always kind of said that free means um, the ability to access it is free, and but, it, but it's also no cost. So um, that's that, but again, free is, you know, not, not really open to interpretation, but it um, has multiple meanings uh, in this case. Uh, libraries and libraries. Okay, so that is the regulations. And if you can see down here, there's a table that if a library does not meet any of these regulation um, subjects, there is a certain loss of state aid. So if you, are 7,500 population or above and do not have a certified director, you lose all of your state aid. If you um, your trustees don't have seven hours of training, you lose 100% of your state aid. And if they're, you're not in compliance with the actual statutes, again, these are regulations, you would lose 100% of your state aid. Um, and then other regulations carry 
50% for each, and those are additive. So they will add up to 100%. Um, so you could, uh, you could not uh, achieve the minimum standard for employees and for service hours and be facing a 100% reduction in state aid. Now, um, one other thing, um, there is a second application. Um, I can't find it here, but there is a mechanism for appealing this. And we actually offer appeals to anyone who um, did not meet any minimum standard. It's called a request for exception form. After I process state aid, the system will tell me who, what libraries didn't meet what minimum standards. And then I send out the form in an email to the library director telling them what minimum standards they didn't make, what they, what they reported, what the minimum standard was, and then giving them the form that they can fill out and send it to me. And then I talk it over with the state librarian to determine if the state librarian will give them an exception to that minimum standard for that year. And the state librarian, it's all totally up to, up to her in this case, um, whether to grant that exception or not. And the, um, the, her decision process usually goes by um, past history, any patterns in failures, like if, some, if a library just can't, isn't funded enough to hire enough employees to meet the minimum standards year after year after year, well then until the, their financial situation changes, we can't give them, um, uh, we can't give them this exception. But it's, it, again, it's totally up to her. There could be other things that she uses to determine it. And we would then notify the library on her decision uh, shortly thereafter. So um, we have a number of questions in the queue. And the first one from anonymous attendee again says, can municipalities offset their contributions in the same way as described for Alpine? So, um, no, because the, and, and maybe I misspoke before, so uh, bear with me. The um, state aid must be used for library purposes, the state aid payment. Um, we saw that um, in the state, in the state aid law, um, distribution, distribution services. Some of these aren't really used anymore. As you can see, like distribution of funds for audiovisual services, we don't use that anymore. Um, optical scanners, we also don't use. Uh, termination of appropriation. Um, application of uh, application of benefits to library services. Benefits received pursuant to this chapter shall not be applied to any other purpose than library services maintained pursuant to chapters yada, 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 the, um, basically the municipal library and county library statutes. Um, so um, they, the, um, to answer your question, a municipality that has a municipal library must use the money for library services. They can't um, use that money to supplement their third of the mill um, and, you know, to take less from, you know, the dedicated tax. Um, it's for library, for towns that are providing library service via contract or memo of understanding or something like that, that to me is a little unclear. And I'd have to speak to an attorney about that to see if they would be able to do it because they, while they're paying for library service, they're not, it's not based on, I don't know if it's based on these or not. I'd have to, I'd have to research that. Um, to see if that is the case. But I know that for municipalities, with municipal libraries, county libraries, they must use the money for library services. And in every case that I know of, they either pass it along directly to the library, or if the town handles the library's finances, they put it in the accounts for the library to use as the library board sees fit. So. Uh, next question, Monica Smith asks, and since the numbers, especially about trustee continuing education are self-reported, what checks are, are in place to ensure that a library is not outright lying about meeting the requirements? So Monica hits on a, um, a, uh, a painful, 
painful thing for me. And that is that um, I, uh, I am one person. I, and I am one person to do all the state aid applications and the whole process um, uh, for all 290 some libraries in the state. I do have an assistant that helps me with um, paperwork and filing and um, you would send, she, her name is Sahar. Uh, she is probably on this call right now. Um, hi, Sahar. Um, and uh, she uh, handles receiving of the state aid forms, cataloging them, saving them to our, um, our, our uh, shared network drive and correspondence between us and directors and, and CFOs and things like that. But as far as, um, do we check to see if libraries are not basically committing fraud um, and, and lying on the information they put on the survey or in these forms? There are certain checks that we have in the survey that I can show you later that can look at previous data to look for anomalies. So that if, if a library says year after year, they get exactly a million dollars from their, from their, um, their municipality. That's going to look fishy after a year or two because they're supposed to be getting a third of the bill and that varies every year. But if the municipality says, you know, well, you're going to get around nine hundred to nine hundred thousand dollars, and we're just going to make an even million for you each year just to make our lives easier, I've seen that happen. I I I, I know of at least one library that that does happen to. So um, this is all a long-winded way of saying, um, if I had another another few people that could um, look into this, we would be able to, if there was reason to, we wouldn't just go and audit people. There's really no provision in the statute to um, give us the power to audit libraries like that. But, um, but it is something that if it's brought to our attention that we will, um, we will look at. Um, and, and, and it has in the past, there have been some times where we have had numerous reports that a library is, um, not being completely honest with things. And we have done some, um, some investigation, but it's very rare. We don't do it um, on a blanket basis and we just don't have the people to do that. So, and, and have not had the people to do that for at least as long as I've been here. So um, next question, um, the library is required to have FTE and full-time professional. So that is referring to the employee section up here. And so um, this is just full-time equivalent is I think a term of art in, you know, um, HR and employment law and things like that. And this basically means that um, there are, um, so let's look at MB down here. For municipalities, so, so there's, if you look at the footnotes, there are um, ways in which you could have several part-time people equal their hours into a full-time equivalent. Um, now, there is also the professional thing where it's required a full-time equivalent. And NA is down here, talks about the director and the minimum hours per week. But there, they're, tr they're really looking at, you know, they're, they're, they're looking at basically making sure there are enough bodies working at the library to for a certain population level. And the uh, see, professional FTE at 35 hours a week and all RFD at 30 hours a week, so we can exceed 10% of its role staff. Um, there would basically be a way that you could say, if you had, um, say in this population bracket, two people, two part-timers working 30 hours per week, um, that were, or two, two full-timers working 30 hours per week, you could do that. Um, I think there's also a way that you could do it so that you would say like four people working 15 hours a week or something like that. Um, Pat, do you, do you remember this? I'm kind of, um, I, 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 think, I, I think you're right that there is, um, you can divide that. But uh, again, you taking you don't count benefits, you know. So if you take two part-time people who may not be making benefits, it's a little bit different. But there mm -hmm. is a way of calculating the number of hours to make um, to, yep. to part-time people. Yeah, we're going to look at that on the survey. 
Right. Um, I think it'll be better to throw them on the survey later on. Yeah, but there and but again, that's a very difficult process because again, a, a full-time person does get benefits. A part-time person, depending upon the number of hours, does not. So yep. there are different um, financial considerations that a library takes into to account when it hires full or part-time people. And mm -hmm. um, the other question that I, I just was interested in the discussion prior on trustee training. Mm -hmm. um, there is no, as Bob said, you can't really, uh, the state library doesn't have the accommodation to track that, but mm -hmm. we certainly do urge libraries to perhaps have just a minimal form to track trustee training. Now, seven hours for a, for a board is not a tremendous, it's just not a per year, per the whole year. All. So if you were, if you were as a director to say like, have any of you looked at a video this past week or this past month that could count? Because so many things, the state library is very liberal in terms of what is considered trustee training. So maybe for your own accounts, you would start doing just an in-house form where you would just mm -hmm. say, Mary looked at this webinar and, and the director um, signs that and you put it in a file. That's the way you could track it, just as we tr track receipts for other things. There is and other training, the training for professional, for librarians and other staff. There is no form right now. Maybe we should do that. I'll have to um, ask the trustee association if they'd like to look at a, at a recommended form. But since it's seven mm -hmm. hours per board, not per individual, per board, but mm -hmm. you as the directors, if the directors are on the call, I think you can make a process where you can have receipt, just as we keep receipts for virtually everything else we do in terms of libraries. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. so exactly. Short, you know, the director could say as part of their report, has anybody done anything this month that they want me to indicate that's part of trustee training? I will put that on a form and put it in my file so that when we do the um, annual report next year, we can have real documentation that our board has met this criteria. Yep, exactly. And, and, and there may be libraries out there that already have that, that maybe yeah, we could put out a call for examples. You're right, Bob. I just don't know of a standardized one, but you're absolutely right. And yeah, I mean, I post something on NJ Pub Libs to ask people to send me examples of how they track an these things. Idea. Right. Yeah, so, um, okay. Uh, we are, I, I have been babbling for a lot, longer than I thought I was here. So I'm going to try to accelerate my uh, question answering and pre presenting. Uh, so Nancy asks, what is the definition of trustee training and does that change according to population? Uh, no, it does not change according to population. It's seven hours for the whole board, depending upon if you're, if you're a small library or a giant county system, it's seven, seven hours for the whole board. And um, the, um, what constitutes trustee training? is not defined anywhere. It is, I, we have at the state library when asked this question said, it must be library related because you're trustees for a library. Um, and it should be related to in some way to your jobs as your, your, your volunteer positions as trustees. So um, if a trustee were to take a class on cataloging, library related, but is it really related to your to being a trustee? A trustee doesn't know how to need to know how to catalog books. So I would I would kind of lean towards that not being um, something. But if a trustee says um, I want to you know take a training on on library law like this one or a state aid, sure, of course that has direct application to to your to your position. So it's basically that it's it, it's it's really an honor system. But uh, try to be, you know, um, you know, take training that's going to actually help you. Um, and if you're spending the time to take it, you might as well do something worthwhile than just basket weaving or something like that. Um, okay. Uh, there's somebody else said and Andrew Luck put something in the in the chat. Andrew, you're you're uh, you're gonna you're gonna get um, you're you're being bad. Um, re regarding trusting training, is it seven hours per board member or the trustees as a group? It sounds like if there are seven trustees, each one has to do an hour. That is correct. It is seven hours for the entire board. So, um, so if you have, even if you have a nine member board, then it's even less time per board member. Um, you, could, you, you could take one of these videos that's about an hour, put it on a projector 
and play it at the end of one of your um, one of your board meetings. And if there are seven seven board members there, there it is. You did the you did the training requirement for the year. You're done. Um, or you could have them each that's, that's do the point. But and you could have an overachiever board member who will do all seven hours for the group. You know, it's not one hour per board member. It is the total. So someone may do four hours and someone else may do three. And unfortunately, some trustees may do none. That is, yeah. it is a, a total group. So it's not broken down to that. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, it, okay. Uh, going back to the, the Q&A, is a part-time director and part-time employees sufficient? If your library has a population below 7,500, then you, you, according to this table, you do not have to have a full-time director. It is often, um, if you can swing it with your finances, it is often um, uh, desirable to have someone that's there all the time to kind of run the ship and stuff. But, uh, but if your finances do not allow that, then, um, you know, according to this, if it's below 7,500 population, you can have a director that not that is part time and also does not have a New Jersey professional librarian certificate. Um, but so. I think there's certain consortiums like Buckles require that everyone has a full time. True. Uh, yep. So yep. That's and a issue, right? Yep. So check with your consortia if they have those requirements. Um, I, uh, I, um, yeah. So that's that's a good idea, Pat. Thanks. Um, Jenna McAndrews asks, will there be any new sections or questions to the, the uh, application? I think she means the annual survey in 2024. As of right now, no. There are not any new federal questions this year, and there are um, not any new questions from us. Uh, I have talked to the state librarian about this, and she is um, very cognizant of um, reporting burden for directors, and that basically means uh, she doesn't want to overall increase the number of questions. She wants to keep it where it is or reduce it even to make the reporting burden easier on, on directors. Um, we are also beginning to embark, actually starting next week, on the readoption process for the state aid regulations as well as the library network regulations, but state aid is concerning this. And so when those regulations are readopted, we may, um, or during that process, we may identify new questions that we need to ask if it comes out that there are new, um, new minimum standards that the library community wants, wants to help hold themselves to. So um, we'll see about that. But for right now, for this year, it is unchanged from last year. Uh, next. Joan Servico asks, um, is the third of the mill funding number provided in October a guaranteed amount or could it be changed during the year based on residents challenging the valuations? Ah, you, 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 you did your homework. Um, if changeable, when and how would directors learn of the final funding number? So um, I have to take a drink before I go into this description or explanation rather. Joan, you're right. The third of the mill number that comes out in October um, is subject to being changed by tax court appeals. Those tax court appeals are generally published um, on or slightly after January 31st of the following year, so in 2024. Um, when uh, around January 31st or on January 31st, I start refreshing that page all the time. And if I don't see it in a couple of days, I contact um, people at the Division of Taxation that I know and ask them where the revised numbers are. And then I look through them and if any libraries are affected, because you know there's a lot of towns that might have their, evalu their, their valuations changed that don't have libraries. Um, if, if any libraries are affected, I will um, A, change the third of the mill spreadsheet that's on our um, per capita state aid webpage and re-upload it, but also contact those directors directly and tell them what their new third of the mill number is. Now, um, in years past, this happens, you know, a smattering every once in a while, um, of uh, libraries, you know, three or four libraries every year, um, or maybe even less, had this happened to them. This year is different. This year, there were 28 libraries that had their, um, their third of the mill go up by over 15% from last year. So um, not only is there a, st a statute in a, that's, that's on the books that says that the municipality must um, request 
permission from the state librarian to um, uh, to get to raise the full amount of that third of the mill, the over 15% amount, um, they must request permission of the state librarian to do that. But for this question, usually the towns that are that see their, their valuations or the third of the mill go down are the ones that had very large increases. Um, very, very rarely do I see a town, town's valuation go up. Um, and that would, you know, would also be a large negative that would be corrected. So, um, and, 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 and also if you looked at the third of the mill spreadsheet, not just the libraries that had their third of the mill go up by over 15%, but a lot of libraries had their third of the mill go up by just under 15% by, you know, by a lot. And so um, I have been telling people to uh, be, be wary. You have the numbers you have now, budget the way you budget now, you know, budget the way you've always budgeted for the, with those numbers, but, no, but keep in the back of your mind that that number may change. Um, and uh, when, it, when it changes, I will let you know as soon as I know, and then we'll take it from there. But, um, but yeah, so uh, that's that question. Um, uh, anonymous attendee says that's something about 8,000. Is the library required to have, no, wait, uh, trying to see which anonymous attendee is a, is a part time director and full time, part time employees sufficient for it with a population of 8,000? No, it is not. It has to be below 7,500. Um, so that's that. And last question in the queue. Um, so staff training is calculated the same. Um, if by, if, if you mean it should be library, library related, related to their jobs and things like that, yes. Um, and as far as uh, the, um, the number of training hours, this is training hours for the entire library, for your entire staff. So um, if you have, you know, 7,500 population, you need to have seven training hours for your library professionals as a whole per year and three hours for all other staff for the whole year. So um, that's, again, that's a minimum. You can by all means have more, but that's, you know, what you would need to qualify for state aid. Okay, let's get moving and, and go. So if anybody has any other questions, once you've read through this um, later on, and um, you know, definitely send me an email, give me a call, let me know. Uh, how and when is state aid distributed? Uh, checks must be mailed on October 1st of each year. Um, the payment shall be made to the government. This is what we talked about before I said, I knew there was a slide about this and, and um, I forget which one it was. Uh, checks may be mailed directly to the library with the approval of the municipal or county CFO. During the, um, the project that I talked about before where we were correcting addresses, we also tried to get libraries to do um, uh, um, electronic fund transfer from the Department of Treasury. So you didn't have to worry about paper checks. Because every year I have a few paper, few paper checks that go missing that get mailed to the wrong place. Um, somebody throws them in a pile and they disappear. And um, doing it by um, electronic fund transfer would be uh, really, would eliminate those, those types of things. Very, very few libraries took us up on that though. So, um, so we'll continue to offer that if a library wants it, they can contact me and there's a process to uh, change the way your account is in the Department of Treasury. But um, for right now, most of them are still paper checks that get mailed out. Um, state aid may be used for um, benefits received pursuant to this chapter shall not be applied to any other purpose other than library services. So like I said before, you can buy books, you can hire people, you can, um, uh, do repairs on your on, on your building. You can move it into capital for capital expenses. You can buy computers. You cannot throw a retirement party for a librarian who's been there for 50 years. You can't um, set up a scholarship fund um, with that. It has to be for things that are going to provide or allow library services to be provided um, through your library. So. Um, so there's three steps for the, to apply for state aid. This gets into the actual nuts and bolts and what the directors are doing, will start to do January 15th, um, or in this case, the municipal CFO. The application for state aid is a form that the municipal or county CFO must fill out. 
Uh, the completed form is emailed to the State Library, you know, to my colleague Sahar that I talked about before. Um, and it must also be emailed to the library. So your CFO has to send it to both of us. Um, it's a PDF, it's a fill outable PDF, and um, it's very easy to fill out on, on a computer, save it, send an email, and they're done. Um, the library uses that information from, from the form on the survey. And when we look at the survey, we'll, um, we'll show you where that is. The form looks like this. Looks like a gray screen. Okay. Um, so it looks like this. Again, it's, it's, it is fill outable. I don't know why it's not clicking there. Probably because I have, it's me and my uh, browser was not acting correctly. Um, so they put down their library name. Uh, municipality, uh, if they're in a county, the county, um, they put down the municipal budget expenditures for the library board. If they're in a county with a county library, the county library dedicated tax paid, and any additional amounts expended for library operations. And if you note, there's a three star uh, footnote there. And that says down here that there, if any amount is in line for here, the CFO must also include an itemized statement detailing the amounts that must be attached to the form. And the CFO, an authorized member of the Board of Trustees or County Commission, or, or um, count, County Library Commission, and the library director must sign that addendum, that, that attachment. Because this is where they're going to report if they, they give you a third of the mill up here. And then down here, they pay for snow removal, they pay for landscaping, they pay for medical insurance, et cetera, et cetera. They put the amount there. It can't just be for whatever. They have to say exactly what it's for, for that year. And then it must be okay by, everybody has to agree, the CFO, the library director, and someone from the board must agree that those numbers are correct. So um, we, off, or actually Sahar, will check this form in when it comes, when it comes to her. And she's many times has sent it back and said, there, is no, there are no signatures on this addendum, or there's no addendum at all and sends it back to the CFO and has them redo it and has them get the signatures and then send it back in. Uh, the CFO also has to sign it, um, put their CFO certificate number and email and phone number. And then once that's done, they can, um, they can sign it. Oh, they also have to put in, if the library has not spent their state aid, um, there is actually a law that says that they have to get permission from the state librarian to hold it for more than two years. So, um, so that's what this is getting at. And we, you know, kind of gently say, can you just let us know why you're holding this for more than two years? Have you just forgotten about it? Or are you doing a capital project or whatever? And then the date. So that is that is the uh, application for state aid. And again, it comes from the CFO. The accuracy certification is filled out and signed by the library director and the library board president. It certifies that all the information entered on the survey is accurate and that the library is, conform is in conformance with all applicable laws and regulations. So you, you're saying that everything you put on there is true, your, your uh, training hours are true to the best of your knowledge, and the, um, that you're following you know, all of the laws that govern your type of library. It's completed, the form is completed and then emailed to Sahar at the State Library. And this is what that one looks like. So, um, you know, Sahar, if, if Sahar is still on here, and you can make a note to um, remind me to put this on our new library letterhead, because this is the old library letterhead, and it's uh, a little embarrassing. Um, so the director will fill all this, this information out up here, and then the board president and the library director will sign and print. And then down here, there are two checkboxes. Um, so um, the checkbox one is copy of director's New Jersey Public Librarian Certificate. Um, I, we, we know that, um, uh, oh yeah, pe pe people are starting to leave. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get, um, get quickly. I'm sorry um, if, uh, if, um, if people have to leave. Again, this is being recorded. So um, I'll keep going and, um, and finish up. But if you have to leave, that's um, totally understandable. Sorry, this is taking taking long. Um, so if your town if your uh, town has a population of seventy five hundred above, you know you have to have a, a director with a professional librarian certificate. You have to check this box and include that 
a copy of that or a scan of that when you email in your um, accuracy certification. And we know that for directors that have been in their library for many years, every year they have to dig their, their um, certificate out, scan it, or in the old days, photocopy it and, and send it in. But it helps because there is a lot of turnover in library directors and we need to make sure that um, everybody is, um, you know, has the certifications that they need. Uh, there's also another checkbox here that if a population served is, oh, is 20,000 or more, then you must include a list of librarians that are holding a New Jersey um, public librarian professional librarian certificate. So that's anybody in your library that is a professional librarian that has a certificate, you just put their names on a list and send it in. Um, and then if there is an, an additional contact person for all of this, you know, some directors will delegate these types of things to someone else in the library, their name is filled out down here. And then um, you save it and email it to Sahar down here, and then we file it and uh, keep it there. And that is accuracy certification. And then the next, the last part of the um, application is the annual survey. And this is the big one. And because we don't have a whole lot of time, I am gonna go through it quickly, but if you're a director, you have your login. If you don't have your login, contact me if you're new and um, I will get you the login. You can um, go into the survey and you'll see when we log in, you can look at any of the definitions. And if you have any questions, by all means, email me. And if you are a trustee and would like your director to show you around the survey, uh, by all means, if they want to, you can do that. I do. Um, I would caution against sharing logins and things um, because this is, you know, it, it's public data, but when it's in a state being entered like that, you don't want anyone to be able to go in there and change it. Um, you want one person in there working in the data and uh, that'll head off a lot of problems. So um, the survey collects all the data needed to determine eligibility for state aid. It collects the data, which is trans collects data, which is transmitted to IMLS, the Institute for Museum and Library Services, and the federal government for their National Public Library Survey. And it collects other interesting information about the state of libraries in New Jersey, just kind of nice things to know. So we're gonna click on the link. And this is the login page will be presented when you actually go there. I'm gonna use my login because I remember it. And it's just an admin login, so you're gonna see probably additional things that you wouldn't normally see. When you log in, you'll see welcome your library name here. And then you'll have a blue enter button and several links here. These links are to the forms that we just talked about, the accuracy certification, the application for state aid. Then there'll be a, a document for survey instructions that'll give all the definitions of all of the questions on the survey and a blank survey because for some larger libraries, the director likes to um, divvy up the survey to different departments and they can take this survey and kind of print out a page and say, here, you go do this and you go do that. So uh, just to accommodate them. And this is what the survey looks like. I'm going to, uh, let's see, who should I? I see Bob Belvin, so I'm going to look up New Brunswick. Oh, that's, that's not New Brunswick. That's North Brunswick. Uh, OK. So when you click on this, when you come in here, your period should say the year prior to the year you're in if you're starting the survey that year. So this coming January, you're going to be um, in the year 2024, you're going to be working with 2023 data. And this will say 2023 here. Um, if it doesn't, click this and select it, but it should default to that when you log in. Your library will be selected up here, and then there'll be a lot of questions to go through. So I'm just going to go through them part by part instead of question by question in the interest of time. The first part is basically address information. Your population is here, your county code, things like that. The contact person, the person that is, um, even the IRS confuses North Brunswick and us. Yep, I know. It's uh, and probably South Brunswick and East Brunswick too. Um, there's lots of Brunswicks. Uh, you'll note that some of these are locked. Like I can't go in and change this. 
because these are things that I have locked that I don't want people to change because they don't change very often. I don't want people to go in here and put in a census figure that is incorrect, for instance. Um, as you scroll down, uh, you come into part one, which is income. So you'll report all the different types of income that your library gets per year, um, state aid from the previous year, et cetera, et cetera. There will be some, um, uh, some questions here like these that aren't editable, those are automatic sums. So as you'll see, when you enter in data, those things will change as you go through it. Um, there's also questions over here with an asterisk. Those are questions that go into that federal IMLS public library survey. Um, one other thing to note when you're um, in here, if you want the definition of a question, you can click on the number of the question and then I'll pop up a little box and it'll give you the definition. So uh, going down here, there's a section of capital income. This section here is the section that um, is filled out with the data from the application for state aid from your CFO. That is why it's very important to get that ap application when they're done with it so that you can fill this area out. Uh, part two is library expenditures. Um, all the different buckets that you have spent um, your, um, your funds on throughout the previous year. Uh, part three is library staff. This is where you report how many staff members you have. Um, uh, we and put this question on here, is your library in the civil service system? Very helpful for us to know that. Um, the total yearly hours of employees, if you know, these are the number of employees working 35 hours or more, basically full-time um, employees. Um, and uh, that's the, the number of them. And then this is uh, hours. So you could say this is you know, 12 times 1,820, whatever that is, but it would probably be less than what this is because New Brunswick may have some part-time librarians and that's where they would be reported in there and down here where we report part-timers, how many actually part-timers you can see that New Brunswick has three. Um, this middle section here is where you'll report um, if your library is population 7,500 above and you have a New Jersey librarian certificate, you'll mark yes or no to the rest of these. You should only mark yes on one of them. You can't have um, more than one yes. Um, well, I guess you can, but it'll probably throw an error or I'll call you and uh, tell you you did it wrong. Uh, part four is library collections. You'll report on the collections, the, the materials you purchased in the previous year and the total materials you own in each of these categories um, in, in, in that previous year. Uh, part five is circulation. There's different circulation buckets here, um, interlibrary loan, things like that. Part six, library service hours. You report the number of days you're open per week, number of evenings, weekends, et cetera, et cetera. Library services is includes attendance in the library, reference transactions per year, some of reading statistics, um, uh, number of, of borrowers, uh, computers, computer type questions. This section, and all the directors are gonna, um, I'm surprised I didn't have pitchforks and torches coming to my office last year when we instituted this. This is new, um, basically from last year, because of the way IMLS has changed the way they want programming data reported. And so all of the people that maintain surveys throughout the country, there's a little over 50 of us, um, we're scrambling around trying to find the best way to ask these questions. And this is what we kind of um, uh, came to, this, this kind of matrix. And so you'll put in, there's definitely definitions for each of these, what one site means, things like that, um, that you can look through and then We'll put in the numbers here, and then they will total up into these numbers here, which you can see they are all questions that IMLS asks. Um, there's also questions for reported, recorded programs, especially in the post-COVID era. There's a lot of um, that. There's a lot of live programs, live virtual programs. Again, these are programs like this. This would be a live virtual program. Um, information on the main library, information on the outlets when whenever I uh, um, some, sometimes people will ask, well, I only have one library. How do I have an outlet? Well, you have one outlet. Your my main library is your 
one outlet. If you have branches, you'd report them up here and then there would be other outlets down here for you to report on. Um, you'll report on your salary. Sorry, Bob, um, I, I didn't, didn't black that out or anything, um, but uh, you, your, your salary is public information. And, um, and so as, as such, I don't publish it online for fear of people um, uh, stealing people's identities and things, but it is accessible um, and you know you can look for that. Um, uh, part 10 is a section of questions mainly dealing with uh, some of the more esoteric uh, state aid regulations, state aid minimum standards. Like is the library member of a regional library cooperative? Do you provide children's programming? Um, the training questions, things like that um, are, um, are there. And then you start looking down at contact information for the director and the board. So if we need to contact somebody, we know who to contact. And then some automatic sums, totals for expenditures and different other things. And then there are still some COVID questions here. Uh, they may be going away. I, I don't know if they're gonna go away this year. They will hopefully definitely be going away next year. But, um, but that's, that's that. Um, for the new directors, you, directors that have been here for a while, you know this, but for new directors, you might see these little amber uh, things here. That is when you complete your survey and you clicked on the submit and lock survey button and you think you're all done, it may pop up and say um, that uh, the data you entered doesn't um, fit with what the system thinks the data should be in that in that question. And it's basically an edit check. It's a, a logic formula that will compare that data to certain ranges and previous year's data and things like that. And will say, what gives, why is this data not, not the way we think it is? You should go back and look at that data to make sure it actually is correct. Because a lot of times you put in an extra zero or something like that, and you generally need to, to fix it. But if it's correct, you would click on this little button that before it's amber is gray, and you can put a note in there that will say, this data is correct because um, we got a lot more money this year than last year or something like that. And then you'll click add, and then this will turn to amber to denote that there is a note there. And that will satisfy that edit check. And if there are no more edit checks, it will allow you to submit and lock the survey. Um, so I know that was a very quick and dirty thing about the survey. If you have any questions, if you're new or old, um, not in age, but in time that you've been a director, um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me. Don't just um, fumble around in the dark and um, and you, you know possibly make a mistake. Email me, call me, ask me a question, and we can get you on the right path. Just generally, I have a slide here. Why, why do we collect statistics? Because I had a question here about why does the state library use information like staff hours? Well, staff hours are definitely for state aid purposes. Um, there, are, there are minimum um, uh, minimum employee levels that you know, the library must have based on their population. But we also want to see just how, um, how libraries are doing in general. Like there's, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but there are definitely times when we look at these numbers for specific libraries to compare to other libraries, to compare nationally, and um, using those, all of the numbers that we, that we uh, get are very important for those types of things. So at a local level, we can compare libraries to each other. We can track trends um, in library service. We can see if the community's needs are being met. And, um, and like I said, it's also required by law um, at the state. We um, use it to determine compliance with minimum standards and determine what services libraries need from us. Um, so there could be, you know, things that um, you know library might need more help with programming if their programming is going down or something like that. And at the federal level, researchers, journalists, policymakers use this data, um, and they use it for planning and policy making um, in the legislature and at um, executive level departments, things like that. Um, this is where you can find all of the past year's statistics. Uh, there are um, a lot of things there, but before we answer whatever questions we have in the queue, I just wanted to point out one other thing about counting opinions about the survey. And when you get into here, you can, I'm just gonna go back to the home screen. 
there is a reports link up here at the top. <clears throat> if you click this, this, and you see a lot of the reports that I've been doing and things like that, you can create reports on your data that um, you can use for to, like I said, to analyze trends, to get things, um, to compare yourselves to other um, other libraries across the across the state. <clears throat> if you have questions about this, um, I can send information out, and maybe I'll actually send some information out just on MJ Publibs in general um, about this. I've sent it out before, but it might be due for a reminder. Um, so it's something to explore, something to look at, and something that can be helpful, um, you know, in planning what your library services will be in the coming year. Um, let's see, there are some questions. Um, Matt Freund asks uh, the date when this is available and due. So generally, the survey opens in the middle of January. And according to my calendar here, uh, it should be open this year on January 15th. And then it will close on March 15th. So you have exa almost exactly two months to, um, to gather the data and input the data and certify the data and lock it and everything like that. So um, let's see, uh, another question. Is there any discussion regarding updating the survey for 2024 or the next few years? I think I answered that already about the um, state aid regulation readoption process. There may be some new questions um, coming out of that. And um, I can always talk to, um, to the state librarian. If you have any ideas, you can send them to me. I can't guarantee you that they would make it into the survey, um, but you know, if you feel strongly about something, you can um, email me and make a case for um, asking something um, additional or, or for removing something if you don't feel it's necessary anymore. Um, and that's it. Uh, this was a long one. I'm really sorry to keep people this long, but um, it's, uh, it's something, especially given that next month, this is gonna open. Um, it's something that uh, I thought needed to be uh, talked about now. So Pat, do you have any uh, closing thoughts? No, I, I thank you, Bob. That is really very informative. Um, this is critical for all libraries, both uh, for the directors and the trustees to have an understanding of the overview of what the state library can, collects how they can fill out the forms and how we can go forward from this. So I think you did a wonderful job in telling well, people everything that they needed to know because it's a very complex issue. And I wanna thank you for doing that because it is something Excellent. a lot of people. So thank you, Bob. Let's give Bob a round of applause. Oh, no, 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 no. Don't, don't encourage them. Uh, but uh, it's a very difficult and every library needs to know how to do this accurately and correctly for not yep. only your own library, but for the rest of the state. So thank you, Bob. Yep. And, 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 and as I said before, especially if you're a new director, um, don't, don't just um, flounder around and, and stuff. I, my job is to answer your questions about stuff like this. So um, definitely contact me sooner rather than later. So, um, so you can uh, get on to more important things. Um, somebody has their hand up. Are they, did they put that up in error? Um, Barbara Fisher has her hand up. Um, if you want to ask a question, Barbara, um, you can put it in the Q&A and uh, we can hang out for a little bit. Um, or maybe she put it up in error. I don't know. Um, but with that, um, I think we can end it. And like I said, this will be rec this is recorded. We'll have it up on the YouTube channel tomorrow. And um, oh, that's right. I wanted to talk about uh, next month's mm -hmm. webinar. So next, so my webinar is like whatever. Um, you know, there's not that much. It's you know, it's the same thing every year and stuff like that. But next month we are having um, a webinar uh, titled uh, "Current Cyber Threats and Best Practices." with Krista Valenzuela. And Krista is the Bureau Chief of the Cyber Threat Outreach and Partnerships um, section at the New Jersey um, CCIC. It's like a cyber security information cell or something like that. Um, I forget the exact, what the acronym stands for, but she is going to be um, giving a presentation on cyber threats that are targeting organizations and businesses and individuals 
and she's going to provide an overview of the tactics and trends in cyber criminal activity and ways that you can um, make your organization and yourselves more resilient and more and, and resist these attacks um, uh, more you know more easily. So um, we have we have about sixty eight people signed up. Um, we have you know that's you don't have a limit basically on the number of people that can sign up. So I, I encourage everybody here to sign up for that. Um, I'm going to be sending out another link to that probably um, next week. So if you don't have the link to it, you can um, uh, you know find it there. Or you know what I can always do? I can always put it in the chat since we have the chat. And uh, uh, NJLTA will also put those links on their website and they will also put the link to this recording on their website so that people can yep. uh, participate. Uh, so we're yep. glad to see so many trustees. Um, yeah, yeah, me too. We're really it's really good. To see that. Yep. And this is another important program. And then I spoke to Bob about doing another evening program with the trustees sometimes later in January where we just yes. have the kind of... Well, for lack of a better word, free for all, where you can ask mm -hmm. questions back and forth, uh, because we know January is a very important time for library boards where there's board reorganization. And let me just get this in while you're still here. If you're a library board member, remember you have to take the oath when you get sworn mm -hmm. in as a trustee. That's another very important piece. So we'll be putting things about that up into the NJLTA track. Um, um, next update. I know Bob sends those things out too. So these are very- Yeah, important. those we send out every year. Um, yeah, it's a very important time of so. year for everyone. So yep. everybody. So have a good holiday, everybody. Yes, Thanks. yes. Have, you have a good and safe holidays. Um, hope everybody uh, gets, you know, some time with their families and, um, or if you don't like your families, time away from your families, who knows? Um, but, uh, but hopefully everybody gets some time to rest and regroup and um, can come back fresh in January. Um, and, um, and, and remember, I put that uh, registration link in the chat, but I'll also send it out uh, yeah. later on. Yeah, again, too. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Yeah. So, all right. Um, I'm going to end it and have a good night. See you later. Thank you, Bob. Bye bye. Yeah.